Hi, I'm Steve Cole, the Southern Regional Manager for MyTech and a fellow of the Institute of Professional Engineers of New Zealand. Now in this particular video, I want to give you a clear understanding behind the design of roof trusses. I want to cover off the evolution of roof trusses, terminology of roof trusses, the relevance of web patterns, and how these trusses perform when compared with a conventionally framed roof. So, Let's look at how these trusses have evolved into the way that we use them in today's construction market. In the very early days, the arch bridge provided an effective method of crossing a particular section of river and yet still provide the clearance beneath the structure. Now, if you extract that through to a simple buttress and rafter type structure, the similarities are there, but it can be constructed in a much more controlled way. The buttress here will provide resistance to the horizontal spread, but does have the disadvantage of large protrusions each side of the building. At this point, the first real truss evolved, in that we replaced the buttress with a bottom cord. Once the spans got larger, the truss web was introduced to provide more stability to the top and bottom cords. Variations on span, pitch, and web arrangements soon became the norm. Now that opened us up to a large number of design options, which leads to the sorts of structures we see in today's market. The actual truss terminology is actually quite simple, in that each structure has what is called a top cord and a bottom cord. Now that forms the external perimeter of the truss. The internal components are called truss webs, now reference is often made to the heel and the apex of the truss. Now these locations are obvious, but what is really important is that they are the points of the greatest connection load. Now often the top cord is extended through to provide for a suffete construction for weather protection around the perimeter of the house. This part is called an overhang. There is also the situation where we may shift the heel of the truss outside the line of the external wall. This is called a cantilever. So there we have the basics of truss terminology. Let's now turn our attention to the relevance of truss web patterns. There is a variety of web patterns for the designer to choose from, but the most important part about those web layers is that in most cases, they form complete triangulation within the external boundaries. So if we look at the web patterns you're more likely to see on site, they will be at the designer's preference to suit some manufacturing system he has. For example, the two most common patterns are the Howe type and the Belgium type. Now during the loading of the trusses, the webs will inherit a compression or a tension load. So it is essential that these members must not be interfered with. I mention this because at times it can be common to see part or all of the web removed on site to accommodate some internal obstruction, such as air conditioning vents, pipes, or hot water cylinders. The best solution, of course, when confronted with this is to seek professional advice from either your trust designer or MyTech New Zealand. Let's now focus our attention on how a trust roof would perform when compared with what we would class as a conventionally framed roof. Now a conventional roof uses a simple raft or ceiling joist structure that will span between the supports, which can be a range of props, beams and under purlons. The designer will then check the performance by having a look at the bending strength and the stiffness. Now typically, if we were to span using trusses, there are a number of advantages. The first, because of the kit set nature, the speed of a construction is quite obvious. Now secondly, in most cases, the timber sizes remain exactly the same. And thirdly, we do have the ability to avoid the use of internal walls where we require. Now, however, there is a big difference here in the engineering performance. The top cord still takes the same bending load but does inherit a compression load. The designer then takes note of the compression strength and the bending strength and designs his truss accordingly. Well, I hope that's given you some insight into truss design within New Zealand. 
and how our trusses perform in today's market. For further engineering considerations, check out our What's It All About series.